Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Patrick Curran, Chair of the Java Community Process Organization, and welcome. A uh, little bit about me. Uh, I have an Irish background. I was born in England. I've lived in the US for 30 years, and I'm married to a lady from Turkey. So I like to mix things up. I'm very glad to be here in Bulgaria. My first time, but I hope not my last. <coughs> Here's what I'm going to talk about. Um, the description, the brief abstract I sent, said we'd be talking about the future of Java. But in fact, I'm going to spend most of my time on history. I'm going to do that because I can. I'm going to do that because I hadn't quite realized I was first up, and I don't want to bore you with a bunch of old stuff about JCP and, and JSRs, which you probably know anyway. I have that stuff later. Um, and because I'm old and most of you are young, and uh, history is important. So I will talk about standards and why standards are important. I'll talk about how we develop Java, and I'll talk about how you can get involved. <coughs> but just a couple of quotes as to why history is important. If you don't understand the past, you're condemned to repeat it. Uh, and just yesterday, your president uh, was at the National Library, and he said, this, if a nation does not have proper approach towards its memory and history, you have no future. So what I'm trying to say here is history matters, uh, and we should talk about history and where we came from before we talk about where we're going. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you something that is hopefully uh, interesting. It's mostly pictures and stories uh, about standards from the very beginning of time. The very first standard was human language itself. If we all behaved like Humpty Dumpty and um, we all decided that words would mean exactly what we want them to mean, then of course we would not be able to talk to each other. So the very first standard that human beings came up with was almost certainly language itself. Let's see if I can see better with this. Yes, I can. <coughs> Shortly after that, we learned, we created uh, symbolic ways of writing down language so that we could preserve ideas over time. We invented number systems so that we could count stuff. Uh, we invented currency because we wanted a medium of exchange. <coughs> Without this, it's very difficult to have any kind of economy. If I have two donkeys and you have a bushel of hay, uh, you may not want donkeys, uh, even though I want hay. So if you have something that can act as an intermediary, everything is cool. Most early currencies were made out of precious metals. The trouble was that people would clip the edges and they take little bits and shavings off them and then melt them down and tend to start off with 10 coins and end up with 11 and debase the currency. And this became a big problem in England in the 17th century. So uh, Sir Isaac Newton, that Isaac Newton, was appointed master of the mint and told to get things under control. And they made it, it had always been illegal to debase the currency, but they decided on drastic measures so people who were caught, caught coining or falsifying or clipping were hung, drawn, and quartered. And pieces of their body parts were stuck on sticks and left around London so people would say, this is what happens to you if you mess with our currency. So some standards are so important that death is the punishment for violating them. So I thought maybe we could do the same in the standards world. And if you you know, build a browser that doesn't meet with the appropriate standards, then perhaps we could uh, hang you. We could leave out the drawing and quartering. Nobody's taken me up on this yet, but seriously, uh, you may remember all the fuss there's been over recent years in China about adulteration of food and drugs and so on. The Chinese in, I think it was 2007, executed the guy who was responsible for maintaining the standards for uh, food and drugs because it was undermining their entire economy and putting things at risk. So, indeed, sometimes death is the appropriate penalty for not doing the right thing. <coughs> Measuring time, uh, very important. And space, this is Galileo uh, demonstrating his telescope to the Doge of Venice in the very early 17th century. Of course, he discovered the moons of uh, Jupiter, uh, laid the foundation for modern celestial mechanics, and so on and so on. <coughs> this allowed us to learn to navigate. Once we knew where the stars were and how they progressed, we could navigate, we could explore the world, we could map the world. <coughs> weights and measures. Weights, we understand measures. This is 
an illustration of how they uh, defined an early standard of length, which was called a rood or a rod. It's about 16 and a half feet. There are four roods to a chain, I think 10 chains to a furlong, and a furlong by a chain is an acre. The word furlong is short for furrow long, and it uh, was intended to be the amount of land that one man could, m could plow in a day with a team of oxen or horses. Uh, Germany, in the early 16th century, they said, what we do, we go to church on Sunday morning, we'll take the first 16 men who come out of church, and we'll measure the length of their feet, and add them all up, and that will be the length of a rod. We've got a little more precise since then. Now we measure meters in terms of fractions of the speed of light, but the same principle applies. <coughs> in the Middle Ages, guilds of workmen would uh, band together to protect themselves against competitors, but also to ensure the quality of the goods they produced so that they got a good name. Uh, they would apply a hallmark, uh, a measure that this meets certain standards. This is a silversmith's hallmark, that's a goldsmith. <coughs> Printing. Uh, very early standardization mechanism, uh, standardizing the side of paper, standardizing language itself. Before the printing press, people would spell words any way they want, more or less. But uh, then we began to standardize the language and to, of course, circulate ideas. And ideas, as we all know, are very dangerous, but very helpful. There are different kinds of standards also, going back to the Chinese example, for quality uh, and to the, to the guild standard. Um, so, the state will typically step in to regulate standards of quality for food and for drugs and for health and for safety. We want to make sure that, you know, things don't fall to pieces around us. These are all kinds of standards. Let's move into modern times. <coughs> I'm trying to watch my time here. Um, Commerce, we talked about in a little bit how commerce developed, but it couldn't have developed without a framework of rules and regulations, a double accounting uh, bookkeeping here. So ways of actually accounting for stuff and also ways of organizing. So the very early days of what they call the joint stock companies, the early corporations, there's a framework of rules and laws and regulations around all of this stuff without which industry uh, and commerce could just, could not have developed. Moving slightly more into the modern age, machine tools. In the early days, everything was made by hand and everything was kind of different size and it didn't much matter. But if you want to build a real machine, you have to be able to measure precisely, you have to be able to cut precisely, and you have to fit the pieces together. So the early machine tool experts, uh, primarily in England in, in the uh, early uh, mid 18th century, were beginning to develop these techniques. Screws and threads sounds like a pretty simple thing where you just screw two things together, but you have to have precise definitions of the pitch and how deep the, the grooves are and so on. So there was a guy called Whitworth who worked for the master machinist of the time whose name was Maudsley, and he defined the very earliest standards for screws and threads, and these are still in use today. If you go to, to a uh, hardware store in England and ask for a socket wrench, they'll ask you, do you want Whitworth thread or metric? This enabled us to build machines, such as steam engines, and then everything, of course, takes off. Uh, railways, this is Stevenson's rocket, the first, uh, the first locomotive. Uh, this actually won uh, a race in my hometown, Manchester. I'm interested in all this stuff because I was born in Manchester in England, where all of this stuff began. But railways were very important for standardizing, not just for business processes like we were just talking about, or parts. Think about a railway engine. If you've got a horse and cart and you travel 15 miles to the next village and it breaks an axle or a wheel breaks or whatever, the local blacksmith can knock one together for you. But if you have a complicated machine like a locomotive and it's 200 miles from its home base, you'd better have standardized parts. You'd better be able to know that if something goes wrong, you can actually fit a new piece on and, and, and fix it. So that was one form of standardization. But the more interesting one, everyone of course talks about the width of the gauges, that the distance between the rails. <coughs> But railways were responsible for standardizing time itself. You know that if you get in an airplane, you travel east to west, then the time zones change. In fact, it's one minute for every 12 miles. In the days before the railways, it didn't much matter. So every village would have its own time. When the sun was directly ahead, that was noon. You go 12 miles in this direction, 
I don't know whether it's before or after, but it'll be one minute off. But in a day on a horse, how far can you go? 20, 25 miles. If you're off by a couple of minutes, it doesn't matter. But once you start going hundreds of miles on railways, of course it does. They couldn't figure out how to put together the timetables. Do you have the time at the destination, time at the origin, time where the train is at this moment? Uh, it was crazy. Of course, if they'd only ever gone north and south, there wouldn't have been a problem because they'd all have been on the same time. But going east to west, they said we have to have standard time zones. So the British invented Greenwich Mean Time in the 1840s, the US followed in the 1880s, and just about everybody else followed shortly after that. Okay, so what's at the heart of all of this is interchangeable parts, like I was saying with the, with the railway engine. Uh, there was a guy called Eli Whitney, you've probably heard of him, he invented something called the cotton gin for sowing seeds, but he, just after the American Revolution, went to the US government, American government, and said, I can build you muskets, and unlike all those other competitors, my muskets will be made from interchangeable parts. All the others were handmade, so you couldn't mix and match. It's unclear whether he actually could do this, but he was a good salesman and he convinced people that he could, so he's usually credited with the invention of interchangeable parts. And we know where that led to mass production. This is Henry Ford's production line with modern T's, model T's. Okay, so that's all kind of pre, pre computer age. So let's look at standards and the, the, the developments and the origins of, of computers. Let's go back to maybe the first one, a mechanical calculator uh, created by Pascal in what year? 1649 got a patent for it, the first patent for a calculating engine. Leibniz, the, the natural philosopher, a few years later created a version derived from this. Um, Leibniz and Newton were big rivals uh, over who invented the calculus. It turned out it was probably Newton got there first, but the notation for calculus came from Leibniz. <coughs> okay, Jacquard Loom was a mechanism for automatically weaving patterns into, into cloth. This is Monsieur Jacquard demonstrating his machine to, to Napoleon. What's interesting about this device is it was driven by basically a very early form of punch cards. Uh, this is a so-called portrait of Jacquard which was actually woven in silk. It was so finely done that people thought it had actually been painted. They didn't, th didn't realize that it was actually uh, cloth. And it took 24,000 punch cards to actually generate this thing. Um, so, the modern punch card, of course, uh, is a little over 100 years old, was invented by Hollerith to tabulate the 1890 census in the US, later went on to, to power all sorts of stuff. I just learned the other day that the, in the US, Social Security, when it was introduced, which is, you know, uh, financial aid for people who are not well off. The first checks that they got were actually punched cards. Um, this is the first real computer, uh, Charles Babbage's difference engine. Um, programmed via punch cards, uh, had what he called an arithmetic mill. Uh, it's all mechanical, um, uh, lots of little wheels and cogs and stuff. It had a printer, and it was genuinely programmable. Babbage had a copy of that portrait, so obviously he was influenced by the notion of punch cards. This was never completed in Babbage's lifetime. He was a much better thinker than he was a businessman, like many computer geeks. So he was constantly, he would never finish the thing he was working on, he was constantly going to work on the next thing. He kept asking the British government for more money. In the end they said, we're not going to give you any more. Uh, but People thought that this could never have been built, that the tolerances of the parts were too precise. Uh, but in around the year 2000, uh, to celebrate the 200th year of his birth, the Science Museum in London said, let's see if we can build a version of this machine from his blueprints, which they had. And they did so. They didn't use modern day uh, metal working techniques. They used tools like he would have had. They found two bugs in the design, two simple bugs. They fixed them and the machine works. So if you go to London, you can see it in the Science Museum there. If you go to California, there's the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, and they have a second copy, which was commissioned by Nathan Mirval, the uh, Microsoft uh, billionaire. 
Um, having mentioned Babbage, uh, good to see plenty of women in the audience here. Let's not forget his good friend Ada Lovelace, uh, Countess of Lovelace, the first programmer. Um, Babbage went on to design, but never to implement, a, a real programmable machine. The first one was a more of an elaborate mechanical calculator designed to, um, to generate the tables that they needed for navigation at sea, celestial tables, so for every day of the year where the planets and so on were, going back to the theme of navigation from earlier. But this one was a genuine programmable calculator, and it was not he, but it was she who first realized that it was the, the general purpose nature of it. So they published a, together a monograph on, on this machine. She published a long supplement to it, longer than the original, in which she explained the ideas about universal programming machines, and she actually included a program for calculating Bernoulli numbers, so for this reason she is credited with being the first programmer. And of course had a programming language named after her, a language created by the Department of Defense in the US, and it was, uh, became an ANSI standard and an ISO standard. <coughs> uh, looking forward a little later to another uh, mechanical device. I had to watch a movie the other day about Alan Turing and his bomb machine, which they used to break the Enigma code during the Second World War. Um, estimated that it shortened the war by two years and saved about five, 15 million lives. Uh, Turing, of course, derived this principle from what he called the universal Turing machine, which was a foundation of modern computing, and uh, modern digital computers would not exist without him and his notion of universal programmability, but Ada Lovelace was there a hundred more years before. <coughs> of course, none of this stuff would work, none of the modern computers would work without electricity, uh, you've probably heard the phrase standards war, where you have two competing standards. Uh, one of the first ones was between alternating current and direct current. Tesla promoted, this is Tesla in his lab. Uh, this is a composite photo, he's not actually there with all of this lightning, but it's kind of fun. Uh, Tesla promoted alternating current, Edison promoted direct current, Tesla won. He won this battle, battle. he didn't win much else unless you count the fact that he's now the name of the best known electric car manufacturing company in history. Um, this led on, obviously, once we have electricity, to uh, transmission of information over the telegraph, to the telephone, to telecommunications, and let's step back again. Standards are not just about technical stuff and machines and the rest of it. They permeate everything that we do in our daily life, starting with one of the most important foodstuffs, beer. Um, governments like to tax stuff that people want, and people like alcohol, so governments like to tax alcohol. But if you have a glass with brown liquid in it, how do you know that it's beer? You need to be able to measure the alcohol content, so uh, I guess a hundred and some years ago, about a hundred years ago, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US was asked to design a device for measuring the alcoholic content of beer, which they did. They were also asked to develop standards for ladies' clothing so that when you went into one of the very early department stores and tried to buy something off the shelf, you would have some chance that when you got it home, it would fit your wife. So NIST was also involved in this. Uh, chocolate. You probably didn't know there's a world standard, World Health Organization standard for chocolate. Um, it defines things like how much butter fat it must have in it and so on. You can't just take any old stuff, color it brown and sell it as chocolate. Although a few years ago, the chocolate manufacturers in the US tried to do that. They said, we don't want to put all that expensive butter fat and cocoa and stuff in chocolate. It's too much, let's substitute vegetable oils. Uh, the US consumers rebelled. Uh, you can look it up online and they had to back down. But anyway, the World Health Organization, believe it or not, defines what is chocolate. Um, music. Music would, well, one person can sing, one person can play an instrument. If they're not tuned, two or three people can. But if you want what we call real music, you have to have an agreement on how to tune your instruments or how to pitch your voice. So there is an ISO standard for tuning frequency. I th don't think they define middle C, it's some note above it, but in terms of the vibrational frequency. So ISO standard for music. Color, what's blue, how red is red. Um, there is an organization called color.org that defines this kind of stuff. 
Um, I don't use it. Oracle employs me, but I, don't, I try to represent the community rather than Oracle, so I use my own branding. But if I was using an Oracle template, which you probably see with Reza, there is a very official Oracle red that you have to use. And if you are off by one or two RGB values, the marketing guys and the PR guys will come down hard on you. So we need standards for color, uh, traffic. If we didn't agree on simple stuff like what side of the road to drive on and what to do when we reach a junction and what the traffic lights mean, then everything will grind to a halt, as it does in many countries in the world. But I'm glad to say, not here in Sofia. Your drivers are great. Um, <coughs> shipping is an interesting case. Um, there is an ISO standard for the size of containers. Uh, before the invention of the container, when you wanted to ship goods from A to B, you had to have a bunch of big strong men with big hooks and ropes and stuff, and they would take packages and things of different sizes and wrap them up in big bundles, and they'd lower them into the ship and have to pack them by hand carefully and have to be careful to pack the ones that were going, you know, first last in, first out, and all of that. And it cost a fortune and was very slow. And someone came up with this notion of standard-sized container that you can pop into a ship's hold, onto a truck, onto a train. And this, of course, is revolutionized uh, transport, which is why we can buy stuff that comes from China at a cost of shipping almost zero. I like to think of this as like packet switching for physical goods, like the internet, but for physical stuff. So there's an ISO standard for the size and shapes and sizes of containers. Sport, of course, if we didn't agree on the rules of the game, there'd be no game. So FIFA has to define how we play football. Medicine, I wouldn't recommend looking at this too closely because it's kind of scary, but the World Health Organization has a great big fat book that defines every possible thing that you could possibly get, every kind of disease, so that doctors can communicate with each other and with insurance companies and drug companies and so on and so on. A few years ago, I was in my dentist, and as I was walking out, there was a little impression that they do for making false teeth sitting on the counter, and a little note next to it, it said, please set teeth, shade A3. I'd never thought of it before, before but of course, you need to measure the color, how bright or, or dingy your, your real teeth are, and you have to match the false teeth to that. So there's a standard for that based on reflectance spectrophotometer something or other, which is way beyond me, but Standards are everywhere. Barcodes for shopping, ISO IC standard, uh, universal barcode to define stuff. A uh, specialized version of that, the ISBN BN number for books. If you have an ISBN number, you can just type it into Google or Amazon and the book will pop up. Home entertainment, another standards war between Blu-ray and HD DVD. Blu-ray one, yay, because it has Java in it. And your portable devices, of course, uh, couldn't be playing music unless we had a standardized way of encoding it into digital files, which is MP3, defined by the Motion Picture Expert Group, uh, which is primarily based in Hollywood and concerned with movies, but this was a kind of offshoot of what they did. So, standards are everywhere. What happens if you don't have standards or if they don't work properly? Here's a couple of examples. Baltimore in 1904, a fire broke out in the business district. Big fire. Um, so the Baltimore Fire Department was overwhelmed. They called on fire departments from about 20 different cities and towns around Baltimore. They all rushed into the center of the city to help, and they took out their hoses, and guess what? They couldn't screw them into the hydrants because there was no standard for the coupling. So, a third of the city burned down, $115 million worth of damage. That was a lot of money in 1904. So, guess what? After that, they said, it might be a good idea if we could agree on the threat and the coupling for, uh, for fire hydrants and fire hoses. Here's another example. 1999, Mars orbit. This uh, orbit uh, has been nine months or so, travel to Mars. They were just about to go into orbit. They fired the engines and there was a mismatch between the units of measurement that they used for the software and the hardware. One was uh, Imperial, British, and one was metric. They ended up firing the engines four or maybe seven times, I forget which, harder than they should have done. Uh, it zoomed down and uh, crashed. So you've got to have agreement. We actually have a JSR on units of measurement designed precisely to prevent this kind of problem because uh, using the type system in Java, you, can, you could never make that mistake. So if you don't get your standards right, serious stuff can happen. Cities can burn down, uh, spaceship can crash, and so on. 
So what's all this about? <clears throat> the $64,000 question for me is whether we are artisans. Most of us are, I think. Artisans are people who are creative. They create stuff by hand. Uh, I used to do woodwork when I was young. And you have a rough, me rough measurement or a blueprint or whatever, but if you don't get it quite right, you shave this piece down, you shave that piece down, you can fit them together. It's much more fun and much more creative to do that than to take a bunch of parts off the shelf and stick them together. But that's what real engineers do. Uh, bridges, once we build them, usually stay up. That's because they are precisely defined, the parts are well defined, well machined, the interfaces between them are defined, there are standards for, for strength and for all of that stuff. If bridges were built the way we build software, you would never dare to drive over one of them. Oops, sorry, the bridge just crashed. Um, so, real engineers, uh, we call ourselves engineers, like I say, many of us, most of us aren't. Um, it's not as much fun and not as creative to do stuff with interchangeable parts, off-the-shelf pieces, but that's, that's what you've got to do if you call yourself an engineer. All right, that's sort of the end of the history lesson. Well, okay, now I'll get into academic mode. But I think, I hope I've convinced you, standards make the world go round. Nothing in the world that exists today could exist if it were not for standards. A general definition of a standard is just an agreement between human beings to do stuff in a particular way, because doing stuff in that particular way makes things simpler or more efficient. A more formal definition, this comes from the International Standards Organization, talks about a document which is established through a consensus-driven process by some organized body uh, that provides definitions for common or repeated ways of doing stuff, uh, in the in, with the intention of improving efficiency again. Two kinds of standards, uh, de facto and de jure. De facto standards become standard just because um, the organization that defines them or creates them has a kind of lock in the market. Windows is a good example of that. Uh, PDF is another. It was, at least in the early days, it was just Adobe's way of storing documents electronically. I think they've since standardized it. But de jure standards are developed through a more formal process by organizations, either consortia uh, or formal national and international bodies such as uh, ANSI, ITU, and so on. The consortia are things like uh, OASIS, W3C, and the JCP. And it's generally agreed that standards need to be open. That means you must develop them through a formal process, and the process is written down, that anybody should be able to participate. There's a level playing field, so all participants have an equal opportunity to, to take part. That there are transparent uh, government, governance and processes, so everybody understands how stuff works, and that everybody can implement these standards. Open standards are good. Some people think you don't need open standards if you've got open source. I don't believe that. Um, if you have open source that doesn't implement an open standard, in my opinion, it's not that different from proprietary software. Yes, you can look at and you can modify the source code, <coughs> and that may give you some advantages. But unless you have a formal specification, it's difficult to understand where it's safe to make changes and where it's not. Plus, you may end up being locked into a single implementation because unless you're very big and very rich, you're not going to want to fork the stuff and take on the onus of maintaining it forever and merging your changes back into the main line so you don't drift too far from the original. Plus, open source interfaces tend to get changed much more arbitrarily, much more quickly than standards. Some people think that's a good thing, but uh, you don't want your APIs changing on you overnight if you've built a big software system on top of them. The main thing, the main advantage of standards is that it allows multiple implementations. If you don't have standards, it's very difficult to have more than one implementation. Here's a practical example. Facebook uses a lot of PHP. They were using the default open source Zen framework slash virtual machine. They decided it wasn't efficient enough for them. They wanted to write their own. They thought they could do better. But they realized, I, I can't do that because I don't know how the virtual machine is supposed to operate. 
There is no formal standard for PHP. I can copy what those guys are doing, but I don't know whether what I'm copying is there because it's a bug, because it's implementation specific, or whether it's supposed to be that way. So they said last year at OSCON, we'd better start by defining a standard for the PHP language, because without that, we can't actually create a second conformant uh, interoperable implementation. So, large users, organizations that want to build global mission critical systems will always want to have a choice. They don't want to be locked in. So they insist on standards. If you don't have standards, you have vendor lock-in. In the early days, you bought your first computer from IBM, that was it. They owned you for life. You had to buy all the peripherals from them, you had to buy the software from them, you had to buy the training from them, you had to buy the documentation from them, because it was IBM stuff and it was different from other people's stuff. Uh, consumers, organizations don't like that. They want to be able to mix and match, swap stuff out. Uh, <coughs> so, open source and open standards really complement each other. Uh, it's a really good idea to implement your standards in an open source manner, create open source implementations, that means more people will use them and adopt them. Um, and it can often be an efficient way to develop a standard to start with an open source project, to experiment with ideas out in public, to ideally create one or two implementations and see what works and what doesn't, and then later to standardize. So, as I said, industrial strength systems should be built on top of standards. Two kinds of standards we care about in the computer world, languages and protocols. This is the Tower of Babel, the Christian story about in the early days of humans, they decided they would build this big tower up to heaven. And God said, no, you're getting, getting too big for your boots here. I don't like this. I'm going to punish you. And the way he punished them before this, they were just one big happy family. They all spoke the same language. He said, I'm going to smite you down, divide you into different groups and tribes that speak different languages so you can't understand each other. That's where the notion of Babel comes from. And interfaces, of course, the ways of fitting standardized stuff together. I'm an old geezer. When I started, there was no such thing as standardized libraries or whatever. Working on little single board computers, if you wanted to take some input from the user, you had to scan the hardware. You had to know which bits of memory would change and how when somebody pressed an A key or whatever. Now you can just take stuff off the shelf, plug them together, and hopefully uh, they will work. Or certainly you can build software faster than we used to 30 years ago. So, on to Java. <coughs> how do we do standards for Java? Collaboratively through the Java community process. Uh, with Windows, what you get is what you get. Or what you get is what Microsoft decides is good for you. Look at the disaster that was Windows 8. Uh, that's not the way Java works. We develop it collaboratively. We have a formal process of developing what we call JSRs, which are the Java specifications. And this is not just Oracle who participates. Oracle's biggest competitors, such as IBM and HP and Red Hat, all also participate in this collaborative process. We also have members of the open source community, such as Eclipse Foundation, and we have a bunch of Java user groups. We all work together to advance Java. You don't have to look at these in detail. The important point is each of the platforms is made up of well-defined components, building blocks, and for each of these there is typically a JSR, a formal specification. This is Java SE, Java ME, Java EE. <coughs> and we do this through this process of Java specification requests. A JSR, as we call them, is led by a member of the JCP, we call the spec lead, they gather a bunch of interested people to help them with it into what they call an expert group. And they have to deliver three things, not just a spec, but also what we call a reference implementation, which is a complete implementation of the spec to prove that it is possible to implement it, and a test suite. We call them a technology compatibility kit, which is a silly name. Um, conformance test suite is what most people would call it. Um, and each of these strengthens the other. When you, when you create the reference implementation, you prove that the spec is implementable. When you run tests against that, you may find bugs in the test or in the implementation. And as you write the test, you find bugs in the spec. You find language that's ambiguous. So testing conformance or compatibility testing is central to what we do. And just like the silversmith puts a hallmark on their stuff, we put a hallmark on ours. We call it Java. This is how we're structured. I'm going to skip over most of this. That's me, executive committee, like a board of directors, administrative staff worked for me, expert groups, 
and members. Um, we'll skip this. Executive committees elected by the members twice a year. We do our stuff in public, so you can check us out on jcp.org. These are the members at the moment. We've got a mixture of big companies, small companies, individuals, open source organizations, and Java user groups. <coughs> Spec lead and the expert group I've talked about. Uh, membership is open, free to anyone. We've got about 700 members. No fees. Most of the members are individuals. Most of the others are uh, corporate members with a reasonable number of nonprofits, mostly Java user groups. Half in North America, half in Europe and Russian Federation. Asia, Middle East, South America are underrepresented. We have a formal defined process for developing stuff. I won't go into the details, but you can check it out in this document. Okay. We have what I call a constitution, which is two documents that define how the organization functions. One is a legal document called the JSPA that addresses intellectual property matters. The other is more simpler, but still fairly complicated, defines the process of submitting a JSR, voting on it, and so on. We work, we change these documents through the process itself by filing a JSR um, to create new revisions of those processes. I've run those JSRs as the, the spec lead. The exec executive committee forms the uh, expert groups. And we've been working on a series of these to, to change the way we work. First of them was very simple but very effective. Before we passed JSR 348, people used to think, and there was some truth in it, that expert groups would meet, usually a bunch of guys in a dark room. Two years later, a spec would pop out the other end. They'd have no idea where it came from, why certain decisions were made. We said, no more, do everything out in the open, public issue tracker, public mailing lists. You must listen to what people say. And this worked very well, and we had a large number of individuals in Java user groups started to join and say, now we can see what's happening, and now we can participate. I'll skip the second one. That was administrative. The third JSR is bigger and scarier because it requires us to modify the JSPA, which is a very old document, and like old code, it's kind of scary to change stuff because you don't know whether this is like a... Uh, redundant artifact or whether this, you know, if you move this line of code from here to there, you'll actually break something. Plus, it's a legal document, so all the lawyers for all the executive committee companies are involved, and that takes forever. But it's important that we do this because um, we want to make sure that we have a full uh, understanding of the intellectual property rights, what people are contributing, and how they will license them out to others. So we're working to modify this, but it's taking us forever. So we spun off some of the things we were working on in that JSR into yet another to create a new membership class specifically targeted at individuals. Um, we're going to call that associate member class. Uh, the big advantage of this is if you're in that class of membership, you can get a formal recognition of your contributions to a JSR. Uh, by being listed on the JSR page on jcp.org. So think about it. You go for a job, two people go, they both say, I understand this Java technology. Uh, one of them says, I not only understand it, I helped to create it. Well, which person is going to get the job? That one, of course. Uh, we expect to finish this very soon, before the end of the year. Everything's done out in the open, so you can follow us. The result of this is we done our very best to break down the barriers to community participation. So we want people to get involved, to influence what we're doing. Um, individuals in the early days used to join as individuals, and once they joined, they were kind of stuck, they were isolated, they felt intimidated. I'm not an expert. I, how can I represent myself as being as much of an expert as these distinguished engineers from IBM? So in the end, we realized that if people work through Java user groups, they can work collectively, they can help each other, and they can teach each other. We have a whole bunch of Java user groups that have joined the JCP. I have to, every time I do this slide, I have to change the font to make it smaller to fit the new ones on. We have more than 50 from all over the world. Uh, the Sofia, the, Bel the, the Bulgarian jug is not a member, should be. So if somebody is here associated with the Bulgaria jug, come talk to me and we'll uh, try and persuade you to join. It's easy to join. This is how. We have two Java user groups on the executive committee. So Java, Bruno Souza from uh, Brazil. He has 70,000 or so members in his user group. And the London Java community, who you've probably heard of. 
Together, these guys created what they call Adopt JSR, which is a program to encourage Java user groups to participate in the JCP, and it's been very successful. Um, there are a number of reasons to do it. Uh, you learn new skills, you will uh, help us to improve the standards. We will make sure that our standards are truly global. Um, for those of you who, uh, where English is not your first language, you may find it more convenient to be able to discuss stuff in your own language, in your own time zone, and then have someone who is maybe more fluent in English to communicate back to the, the spec lead and the expert group. Instructions here, it's easy to get started. This is a genuinely international effort. 28 or more jugs participating from South America, North America, Europe, Asia, Africa, Middle East. There's a list here of some of the things that they help to do in uh, primarily in Java EE7, but also in Java SE8. And there's a whole number of ways that you can participate from very simple stuff where you don't have to be a big technical expert to more technically complex stuff if you are already a bit of an expert or you want to become one. So there's a whole range of stuff. You don't have to feel that you have to be a super technical expert in order to participate in these programs. So we really want people to join us. Uh, there's a number of links here. There are two other ways that you can participate. If you'd rather work on the implementation of JSRs rather than on defining the specs, you can join the Open JDK project, which is the implementation of the reference implementation for Java SE. Or you can join Project Glassfish, which is the similar project for Java EE. And so, uh, we really want you to join. We don't want you to do it at charity. We want you to do it because it's good for your career. You will learn skills which will be helpful to you. Things that distinguish a smart engineer from somebody who really advances in their career. Because no matter how smart you are, there's always somebody else who's as smart and is willing to work for less money. So, join, participate, and uh, you can help us to create nifty new technologies such as this uh, Java-powered uh, hi-fi kitchen device. So, uh, that's how I got from the ancient past to the future. Java's 20 years old this year. I don't know if we'll make it to the 25th century, but it's certainly going to be around for quite a while. And uh, you can help to define how it's going to look in the future. You're the guys who are going to be taking over from my generation, and uh, you define what the next version of Java is going to look like. So please join us. That's it. I'm done. If anybody has, I think I've got five minutes. So if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. 145 slides. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? No? Yes? I'm sorry, what is the process to create a... Sophia user group. Oh. <clears throat> um, it's pretty easy. Uh, the best thing would probably be for us to put you in touch with somebody who's already running a Java user group. There is a active mailing list for Java user group leaders uh, and the people who are on that are very helpful. So rather than me try to describe it in, in real time here, if you're interested, track me down later, and uh, I'll put you in touch with those guys, and they will help you. But you can start small. Uh, so, yeah, track me down later. Other questions? Okay, we need a few minutes for changeover. Thank you again for coming, and enjoy the rest of the conference.